And over the next 20 minutes, uh, I'm aiming to share uh, some of what I'm seeing in terms of what's changing out there in the world, and also some themes or some things that I'm, I recommend the leaders that I work with to focus on uh, to get the very best from their teams, given the level of complexity and change out there. Just a quick reminder, if you want to see the presentation in uh, in large scale, please just double click on that image um, and then you'll get a smaller version of me throughout this presentation. So I'm, I'm going to make a start and uh, if you have any questions throughout, please add them to the chat and then I'll come back to those at the end. So let's make a start. So for those people that I've not yet met, uh, my name is Stephen. I'm the CEO and owner of OpenSquare, a company that helps leaders in complex environments, pred predominantly IT, to get better results from their teams. My background is in predominantly also cloud computing. Uh, I was a senior leader in a number of organizations. I talk about that specifically and particularly um, as a kind of setup to this session. When I started my career in IT, in leading IT, like many people, I looked out and around me to see what was there. So were there best practices, were there processes, were there things that I could invest my energy and time in and invest my team's energy and time in to make us perform better as a group? Uh, and I think probably over the years I've tried all of these. In summary, while they in part helped and they got us and allowed us to move on a little way, they weren't a complete solution and there was always something missing from each one of these. And the reason for that was while we describe these things as being best practices, they perhaps are only best practices in certain circumstances, i.e. where I was working or where my teams were working, things were changing so fast, there is no such thing as best practice. So to highlight and share some of the kinds of things that caused these things not to work, I'll give you a kind of glimpse into what I'm seeing in the world uh, at the moment. A number of these things you will have heard of, things like, for example, artificial intelligence in service. So as you call into a call center, for example, why would you need to have a, a human at the front door answering that call for you? That could just as easily be uh, an artificial intelligence bot or device, so to speak, answering. The image here is from a conference where, a service desk conference, where a robot actually opened, keynoted the conference. Some organizations we know are failing to adapt, but some are taking chances. So McDonald's last year purchased a company called Apprente, $300 million for an artificial intelligence company. What are McDonald's doing buying an AI company who specialize in voice recognition? It may help their front line. It could, for example, replace the humans or the need for humans at the drive throughs or indeed throughout their stores. The stuff on the right hand side, we're seeing a lot. Of course, an event like today is a perfect description of how things are changing in the way that we work. And then along the bottom, we see more and more uh, in terms of technologies and applications arriving every single day. This kind of concept of uh, Internet of Things and so on is proliferating. A simple example there is in the bottom left hand corner, the Model S Tesla there runs on approximately 100 million lines of software code. Um, where at the same time, the current fighter for the US Air Force, the F-35, has only got a paltry 25 million lines of software code. So a quarter of the number starts to illustrate the complexity. The last thing I'll call out here is around cloud. There are three main providers of cloud and they are allowing, they're providing the canvas that everyone else is playing on. So all of those other applications there will be using one of these. Next time you watch a Netflix show or you go onto BBC iPlayer, for sure you're connecting to some of their infrastructure, but the data, the video that's being served to you is actually coming from Amazon, from AWS along the way. So the summary of all of this, as we're seeing, is there's change and complexity everywhere. Wherever you're standing right now, you can kind of be sure that tomorrow things won't be quite the same. Organizations, and I know Peter mentioned this briefly in his talk, organizations like the World Economic Forum are helping and are trying to show leaders and show organizations the kind of things that they should be focusing on and are calling out the kind of skills described here, the kind of innovative, creative skills as being more necessary and more important and those that are growing in this environment than those which relate more to kind of manual coordination and otherwise. So in the remainder of the conversation today, I'm going to take you through five themes uh, that I've found work well when 
operating or working with teams in these kind of complex, changeable environments. So if you lead teams, um, then hopefully there is some stuff in here that will help you or you might to help you get some better results with your teams. So the first focus, the first of five in here, I, I'll start with a question and albeit um, we're not engaged in a conversation to ask you the question as an audience. So I'll kind of do this for you, but how do IKEA make you want their products? Now, often when I ask this question to teams or to people, um, they'll talk about the kind of labyrinthine route through IKEA as the thing that makes you want the products. That's probably what very cleverly makes you buy the products. What makes you want the products, however, is the visualization that they give you. The As you're walking around the store, you can find uh, the sofa you like, but more than just see it, you can sit in it, sit in a mock-up of what that room might look like. That mock-up, that visualization, creates some kind of an emotional connection between you and the object and that's the kind of cause that's why we see um, the couple struggling to put the sofa in the back of the nissan micra in the ikea car park what's that got to do with us well as a first point wherever you are and it really doesn't matter your job as a leader number one is to engage people in the destination why are why are we going where we're going? Why is that important? And take that metaphor. It's not just simply telling them what the destination is. We know that doesn't work. You have to engage them in that destination. Let them sit in that sofa, experience it, and understand really truly what that destination is for them. A good example of this working in practice recently through COVID, a company that I'm doing some work with at the moment, their desktop support team, who are normally not recognized as being a headline act in the organization, let's say, they're a kind of hygiene team that sit in the background. During COVID, they were given a very simple or have been given a very simple mission, which has been to keep people online, do everything they can. Now, given that very clear destination, and of course, with the information in the media and what's going on around the world, that's colored in and engaged them in that kind of destination. The results that we've seen or the feedback we've seen isn't just thanks high csat we've actually had people commenting on how creative and adaptable that team have been which is very new and very uh, it's unique for that team so far the question of course for the team is how can they emulate that clarity of focus and that clarity of destination and therefore kind of unbridle all of their creativity and their thoughts and some of the other themes in here i'll add but certainly that clear destination to purpose is without a doubt number one. So that's my first theme here is to, to connect people to a vivid purpose. And in doing so, you really do create a bedrock of ownership. Uh, and from that, great things will flow. The second focus in here, uh, I'll, I'll lead into with this picture by Richard Westall or this painting by Richard Westall. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the painting, you may be familiar with the myth. Um, this guy at the bottom laying back is Damocles. And Damocles was a servant to the king, Dionysius. Now, Dionysius was a bit fed up with Damocles because Damocles was somewhat petulant and kept telling him or reminding him how lucky he was that he had all of this money, this wealth and these servants doing everything for him, how easy his life was. Dionysius, to kind of teach him a lesson, came up with the idea to let him be king for a day with one condition, that above him was suspended a sword held by a single horsehair. Dionysius was trying to teach him the lesson that while power comes with all of this, uh, this, this ease, let's say, the, the riches and the splendor, it is also fleeting and can very quickly change. The point I want to call out from this, however, is slightly different. That the question of whether or not Damocles actually completed the day, and the answer is no, he didn't. The threat of the sword meant that he, so to speak, quickly learned his lesson and stepped away. He was frightened and couldn't complete uh, his day as king. Bringing that a little bit out of myth, we see that same kind of thing happening, unfortunately, in a number of well-known disasters, whether it be United Airlines Flight 173, Challenger, or very harrowing the case of Elaine Bromley, who a, a healthy 37-year-old woman who died because of a mistake during a routine operation, actually before she even went into the operation. All of these things, as an attributed cause, have a fear of speaking up, just like Damocles, a fear of acting and doing something. In business, this happens regularly too. A company that I was working with last year 
we were trying to make a change to a process for a service management team. And one of the team wasn't taking action, wasn't trying the new process, despite the existing service not being very good. When we spoke to him, the cause was this. What, what will people think about our team if with that new process we're less effective? And once again, we're talking about fear, fear of recrimination or fear of embarrassment, humiliation, whatever it is, preventing this guy from taking action. This thing that I'm kind of alluding to has a term, and if you haven't met it before, it's a thing called psychological safety, researched and kind of pioneered by Professor Amy Edmondson from the Harvard Business School. Simply for purposes of this presentation, there's, if you imagine an environment that is not safe, it's where it's not safe for people to try things, you will see these kind of symptoms. Failure when it happens is punished. You must not fail. You have to complete things 100%, otherwise it's not a success. And accountability is forced on people. Compare that to a safe environment, however, where good failure, failure where you try to do something unique and you learn something is rewarded. Mistakes are considered as opportunities to learn. Challenges to authority and being vulnerable are welcome. Then people will willingly take accountability and willingly step up. There's a strong belief that these kind of environments, had they existed in the previous uh, disasters, for example, in the organization that I was working with, the outcomes could have been very different. So my second point here then is to shift our response to failure. Once you've set that amazing destination, give people the space to play, allow them to create the, if we come back to my COVID example for the desktop team, not only did they have a mandate or a direction, sorry, no one was criticizing them because the expectation was to try to do everything that they could. And surprisingly, or rather not surprisingly, innovation and collaboration came from that. So we're on to our third focus, and the third focus I want to share today come, relates to skills, which is likely to be a subject for many people, um, I would imagine, today. If we imagine our company is at the end of this street, we're all quite aware of trying to get great people to your company, we've got to get them to walk past all of the other great companies that are out there. And unfortunately for us, often, our company doesn't have the capability, the reputation or the reward even or the culture that might attract those people through the front door. What's worse, the skills themselves are getting harder to find. And in IT, as I say, where I particularly major, the skills gap continues to grow. And some independent research that we did last year, looking at the skills being sought, saw that something like 10% or greater than 10% actually of all job adverts in August last year for IT people included artificial intelligence, machine learning, or data science. 10% doesn't sound like much until you say that five years before that, that number was basically zero. That growth in skill continues to rise and rise. So what do we do? How, how do we help our teams to have the right level of skill? The answer actually truly is gonna be a blend of things. So if we imagine skills on this kind of spectrum, we can on the left-hand side do nothing um, through to learning on the job, learning through experimentation, learning through doing, training as in formal training or hiring the skills we need. On the left-hand side, I guess we've got a risk that we might not be able to afford to wait uh, if we do nothing. And on the right hand side, the skills we want might not even exist, even if there is competition for them out there. So our recommendation is to build a strategy around the center of this. You need all four things, but major on the, the center too. So learning and training wherever possible, learning through experimentation and trying things by sharing skills within your organization, and then being able to bring skills from the outside when people do do training or attend events, mechanize how that training or that knowledge comes into your business. One particular thought I wanted to share here and something that you can begin to do in your own strategy to towards skill is to think about skills slightly differently. Many organizations that I work with uh, and have worked with and been part of indeed treat teams as discrete objects. So team one has one skill and so on. I'll introduce this concept or this idea of pie shaping people. Pie in terms of the shape, simply because you've got two legs in two different areas, is where a person can adapt between more than one team, which allows you to flex. And you can take that to the extreme and even go as far as comb shaped people. So not only do you get the benefit of people being able to flex, you also get the benefit of cognitive diversity. If you have people that are very homogenous in a team, you lose out on the uh, simple ideas or the radical ideas that may come from somebody outside of the team. 
And he's, this certainly isn't crazy and people do it all over the place. So next time you hear uh, someone announced that available staff need to go to the checkouts in your local supermarket, that's what they're doing. Those, the people that are coming across to the checkouts have at least some of the skill and are able to flex and adapt. So I've got two more to run through um, before we close. Focus four uh, in, in this presentation after uh, visualize, humanize, and then organize all about skill is to think about change. And when we think about change, and certainly if you look in the media on change, there's a kind of a stereotype that pretty much all of it fails. 84% uh, fail at transformation and so on and so on. I spend my life in this space and I can tell you that there is a lot of change that fails. And there are, for every uh, story like that, there are a list of reasons from someone as to why they fail. I'm gonna simplify all of that and just say, back to my point earlier about complexity, that's what's missing. We misunderstand how complicated the environments we're making change in. Thinking about what change is, is it similar to this paper aeroplane where we just are turning a known piece of paper into an aeroplane, or is it more like the bottom one where the link between cancer and smoking found in 1954 leads to a destination in England at least to eradicate smoking by 2030? I think very much changes the second one. So the idea of trying to apply a process to something so novel as that that we've never done before, we need to be learning along the way. Of course, in such a description, change is going to fail. Anything involving people, we're at some risk. Just in case you uh, had any doubt that working with people is slightly unpredictable, I just invite you to look at the next slide for a few seconds. All right, I'm going to move away from that. Um, uh, hopefully that worked. It certainly does for me every time I look at it. You end up with some kind of a, uh, a physical response to that picture, uh, starting to worry and your palms might sweat about being on the side of the building. Now, if that's how you react to a picture, it's kind of unsurprising that people are challenged or rather find it difficult when we're trying to change the way that they've been working for the last 20 years. One thing that I'll give you today just to think about is to think about people's behavior like this as a balance, where on one side you've got things that inhibit and on the other side you've got things that promote. Logically, if you've got less that promote the change, nothing's going to happen. And coming back to our guy from earlier about the, the change in the service team, his fear, that lack of psychological safety very much stayed on this side. So in your own teams, draw that picture, write things down and see what's happening in the system. So for change or for realize, see change as a complex system. Don't approach it with a process. Unfortunately, it won't work. For the final focus in here, um, I'll start with Deming saying that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And I can demonstrate that very quickly and clearly with an example like this, you'll have your own. If we imagine that to satisfy this customer, we have to get them through these three teams, that's fine. But often those three teams have got competing or different targets, different objectives. And regretfully, what that means is we end up with delay between the teams. The focus isn't there to get someone across. And what does the, the user do or the customer do? They find their own way through the system, either by speaking to someone they know or chatting to the boss and creating a kind of storm of escalation in order to get people somewhere. Nobody wins in these kind of circumstances, certainly if you maintain the status quo like that. Of course, we see this in real life too, where a system was designed uh, as in a path around the side here, but of course, people have designed or adapted their own system here to take the easier path across the grass. My uh, urge to you is when you see these things occurring inside your organizations, or when you see this kind of, this kind of behavior happening in your teams, the thing not to do is double down on the process and put a sign up that tells people to keep off the grass. The better way to think about this is how can you adapt the system? Even better, if we come back to our example from earlier of having cross-skilled people, those people can actually even move around as different priorities happen in the team. So we're kind of almost back to that idea of available staff to the checkouts, please, that we talked about earlier. So that's my fifth and, and final theme around looking at systems thinking and mapping in teams once you've done the other stuff. And all of that forms part actually of a, a leadership program which we provide to our clients, which goes much deeper and includes uh, an amount of consulting and coaching too, to make sure that the themes in here don't just turn up on slideware. As a very last slide in here, uh, I put my details in chat a little earlier. If you'd like to get in touch, my details are on the left-hand side of that slide. And also if, 
you go to the site listed there, which is bit.ly forward slash open square bio, um, you'll be able to get a copy of our free ebook, which goes into much more depth about change and the psychology of change. A set of tips, which will come to you on a daily basis for 10 days that go into, again, some more examples across this program and further updates too. So there you go. Thank you very much for bearing with me through the presentation. I hope you found some value uh, and some use from some of what I've talked to you about today. Uh, and I'm just going to take a quick look now in the chat to see if there are any questions. Otherwise, I wish you a wonderful conference.